Good day to you. Um, I'd like to welcome you to part six of my talk, Voices of Rhodesian Soldiers. Um, the word Rhodesian Soldiers is plural, um, as I hope to get other national servicemen and territorial men to give their stories um, in, in this series. Um, the reason being that the regular and elite companies have had so much exposure on YouTube that I've decided to start interviewing people who did their national service in the army, in the police, uh, also other units like artillery, Rhodesian armored cars, and so on. So the first um, uh, five episodes were on my own national service. And going forward, I'd like to just uh, give a, a brief overview of what I experienced in my territorial service, which lasted about a year. Um, at the end of 78, uh, I stood down from one independent company um, under Don Price, and I stayed at Victoria Falls with my girlfriend. Um, I moved in with her. I'd become a regular employee of the Casino Hotel, where I was a croupier. Um, I had a very happy life. We started work at 8 o'clock, finished at about 2 in the morning because we didn't have any uh, have all that many um, tourists coming to the hotel at that point in time. So it was an idyllic lifestyle. We would sleep in until about 9 or 10 in the morning and go somewhere for a, a leisurely breakfast or a drive down to the falls or in the afternoon um, go to the, the other casino hotel where we were allowed to pull the one-armed bandits. We weren't allowed to play on the tables because we were croupiers and might have had a bit of an advantage over the the tables there and it was a lovely lifestyle on on the odd weekend we would drive down to Bulawayo stay at the Greys Inn um, or one of the other hotels there and even went to Durban in South Africa where we had a lovely holiday uh, in what to us was bliss and freedom in a country where that wasn't at war at the point at that point in time um, and uh, that, that carried on for about three months, and then one day I got a, a, the brown envelope that we all feared slide under the door of the house where I lived in Dale Crescent in Vic Falls. And of course, it was my call up um, papers um, to go into the territorial army and continue the fight against the terrorists in a territorial capacity. I was still a, a, a second lieutenant, and I'd been told to report to. Uh, 2nd Battalion R Rhodesia Regiment in Bulawayo on a certain date at a certain time. I think it was March sometime, um, 79, somewhere around there. And um, anyway, the, the date rapidly approached. I, I was quite depressed about it. I'd got used to civilian life. I was tubbier. My hair was a bit longer. Uh, I really didn't want to go and, and leave Maryland. And... Um, it was with a heavy heart that I climbed on the train. Um, the call-up papers provided um, a, a ticket to go to Bulawayo. Uh, Bulawayo is the second second biggest city in the country, um, down in the southwest. And um, so I clambered on the train the night before, arrived there in good time, um, only to be told uh, that my platoon, in fact the company, had already moved out. Uh, the day before, and we're down at Chiritsi. And this confused me. I had to look at my call-up uh, date and time again, and it was accurate. Uh, nobody could explain why I was told to report a day after the company had actually left Bulawayo. But uh, within a couple of hours, I was put on a light aircraft that was flying down to Chiritsi anyway. And that's how I got to meet um, my company. Uh, a Company 2RR, under the command of Major John, well, his surname began with B, Bravo. I won't uh, say his surname because he might still be living in the country. And um, I very quickly realized, and I think the Major did as well, that we didn't really like each other. <laughs> so if you're watching this program, I apologize, John, but I didn't like you and I don't think you liked me. Anyway, it wasn't the greatest way to start my my 
territorial period of service. And in those days, we were in for six weeks and out for six weeks, in for six weeks, out for six weeks um, as civilians. And you can imagine what strain that put on businesses, on your, your mental health, everything that you can imagine. You were a civilian for six weeks and then you were fighting for six weeks. And I'll take my hat off to the ladies. They, they put up with a lot. They had to look after children. They had to run businesses, their husbands' businesses on many occasions or farms while their, their male loved ones went off to war. But for the guys, once we were in a uniform and our, our civilian domestic life was sort of behind us, um, we looked forward to being with the guys uh, because the camaraderie of men in uniform is something that you will never forget. And I'm still friends 45 years later with the guys I served with. They, it, it's amazing. When you experience fear and danger with people, um, that friendship is magic and it lasts forever. Anyway, I eventually linked up to, uh, with the company and our area of operation um, was Matibi 1 and 2 Tribal Trust Lands, which I think if I remember right was southeast of Chiriti, which is in the southeast of the country. And um, we commenced patrolling there. It was a very hot area in terms of terrorists, as well as the heat. And I, I quickly started to realize that we were losing the war when I was down there. Um, there were The gooks were moving around in large numbers. We actually ended up patrolling in platoon strength, or at least half a platoon in strength, because the terrorist groups were anywhere between 20 and 50. We came across areas where they, they even had little sort of parade squares, with their bushes under trees that cut holes down through uh, the soft rock in the area to find water. And so they had very well est established camps, which was quite brazen and showed that our manpower was getting pretty stretched at that point. Um, that called up the, I it heard 17 contacts in one day. And, um, it, it was a very nerve-wracking period. I, I also experienced uh, one contact there where we were following a group of 10 and we bumped into their tail element. We killed one of them and um, that was that was uh, something interesting for me, a direct contact with the enemy. Um, and you know, you sort of stand outside of yourself uh, when that happens. Um, I'm not trying to boast any sort of bravery or anything, but things happen so quickly that you you don't have time to get scared and you don't feel scared. Your your training kicks in and you just do what you have to do. But the the patrolling there was tough. It was in countryside where the trees were only slightly taller than your head, so you couldn't climb up anything to see what was around you. You were just stuck in this wall of vegetation. And it was a great place for terrorists to hide. There were some open areas as well where there were a lot of palm trees, which surprised me. But I believe that the seed, the seed from those palm trees were eaten by elephants, passed through their digestive system, and then the remainder of the seed plopped uh, onto the ground with their dung, which was a source of nutrients. Um, nature's wonderful and palm trees would grow up. So basically where elephants walked along the banks of rivers, these palm trees had shot up. Um, not unlike Victoria Falls, where I patrolled for over a year. And so that, that call up happened. Um, another thing that happened while I was there was we were, we were turning off a main road to go down a secondary road to our drop off point. And, um, uh, there was a sixth sense with a guy um, on the lead truck. He actually had a, a dog with him that had been trained to sniff out laying mines. And he stopped at this wide junction, got out of the vehicle and moved forward with the dog. We got off our vehicles and went into all-round defense. And the dog, which was a Labrador, had not moved more than 20 uh, meters before it sat down, which is what it was trained to do. And the engineer very quickly uncovered um, a boosted mine. That's two mines, one on top of the other. The mines used by the enemy there were the TM-46 or TMH-46. I can't remember the exact designation. I think they were about 
12 kilos of explosives in them. So a, a boosted mine would uh, make a really nice, nasty mess of a truck. I think the driver would still survive if it was a front wheel de detonation, but certainly the engine and the, and the chassis outside of the, the armor protection and the, the, the wheel arch protection would be badly damaged. So we were very grateful for that man's uh, sixth sense. And we, we carried on to a point where we had to cross a river at, at night, which was um, quite a hair-raising um, incident because you, I was always in the lead of um, this platoon that I was leading. And, and you know, you'd be fumbling around in the water trying to find safe perches with your feet and the river's going by and you're imagining crocodiles are coming. And then you get on the other side and... Uh, um, so basically, I'm just uh, telling you a few of the experiences that I had there. Um, going back to the contacts in Matibi 1 and 2, you know, like I said, I heard 17 in a day. And uh, the paratroopers would jump out of their planes, the RAR paratroopers, to either form stop groups or uh, sweep lines. We could see them less than a kilometer away from us. And so the, the place was heaving with the enemy and also us. I think we had about 800 men on that HDF at that, that point in time, just uh, coordinating with each other to see how we could trap the gooks in that area. After that call up, um, I went back to Bulawayo and my girlfriend Marilyn had come down from Victoria Falls and we met at the Holiday Inn and I remember I, w I was skinny, I was buggered, I'd been bitten to death by ticks. I, I just felt awful. I just, I didn't want to do this anymore, to be honest with you, as I'm sure a lot of uh, territorials uh, felt that way. And it was just when I climbed into bed with her at, at the hotel and felt her softness and warmth, and, and only then did the the stress sort of come out of me. Um, although I only had one contact on, on that tour, um, it was nerve-wracking. And, um, you know, I'd noticed a few flakes of skin leaving the palms of my hand. I went back to Vic Falls for about another two or three months, and then I got another call up, and I went back to exactly the same area, experienced very similar things. Um, once again, it was six weeks out and six weeks back in, very disruptive. And then on my third call up, um, I was posted to uh, Mabaluhuta, which is right down in the southeast, not that far from the Mozambique border. And um, this uh, camp was uh, right on the edge of a river. It had a runway. Uh, with a very good um, hospital there, um, uh, sort of, uh, I believe it was donated by the South Africans, and um, it was on the side of the runway, and that's where the wounded guys would be taken to um, from from the southeast, including special forces and others would be dropped off there uh, to be patched up um, in very good facilities before being flown on to, to bigger hospitals. Um, our, our patrols were from the Mozambique border um, to about 15 kilometers past the power lines that ran from Kaborabasa into South Africa. Um, now, the first day that we were deployed, I had a sixth sense that something was wrong, and uh, we sort of uh, edged our way forward and discovered an anti-personnel mine right in the middle of the road. Um, and the next time I went in, we actually hit one, and it blew off the ref left front tire. I was impressed with the guys. They returned fire rapidly from the vehicles, and then ran off the back of the trucks to avoid any anti-personal mines, and went into all-round defense. We then commenced a patrol um, in, into Mozambique. Like I said, it was about, um, I think the power lines were... I don't know, I'm just guessing, about 20 kilometers from the border, and we went 12 k's beyond that was the final extremity. 
I later worked out that um, one of our special forces guys, um, uh, his name is, uh, or his nickname is Crooks, um, he got separated from his guys over there in Mozambique and we were given orders to look for him by standing along the power line and acting like a net, spreading our guys out, um, turning our caps over so that the orange day glow panels could be seen by him and just basically rolling up our sleeves so that a bit of our white flesh could be seen. Otherwise, we'd be easily mistaken for Frelima soldiers at, at a distance. But we never ever saw him. I believe he walked all the way from Mapai, I think it was, all the way back to Rhodesia. But just going by the dates of his incidents from the book that I read and, and my own time on call-up, um, I think it was him that we were looking for, but we didn't know his name at the time. Um, once again, an intense place to operate. There were large groups of terrorists moving into the country. Why we never found them, I don't know. We did have one large group. Uh, we, we ambushed a wide junction on a road. Uh, we ambushed the northern arm of this pathway and they passed behind us on the southern arc. Uh, just, you know, it was just my luck. I could never t get to grips with these people. Other things I saw there, um, an aircraft came over to, it was a Lynx, which was the American push-pull aircraft used in Vietnam. Um, um, and that was shot at with anti-aircraft guns and there were puffs of uh, explosions all around him and uh, RPG-7s being fired up to detonate at the terminal distance. I was very switched off when that was happening, but another guy called Gary, who was with me, grabbed the radio and called up the aircraft and, and, and told him to break left and get the hell out of there because he was being shot at. Um, I was a bit of a spectator in that episode, uh, as I was in a later one, a very big one, at Victoria Falls, which I will be telling you about. Um, so there, there was lots going on there. The mosquitoes and the, the guys suffering from heat fatigue was unbearable, the heat was unbearable, um, and I said, said to the Major when we got back to base camp one day that if he sent us back without mosquito nets or some type of repellent that, that we weren't going to go, because if you looked up at the moon it actually looked like it was shimmering from the, the amount of mosquitoes. Um, a massive shortage of water in the area and these little rivulets that had been washed away washed away the soil had been washed away by the rains in the rainy season and so you'd go down 15 feet into a, a riverlet or rivulet whatever you want to call it up the other 15 feet walk 20 feet uh, down the other side up and over terrible country to patrol in and the, the most incredible thing happened one night we'd run out of water we were we didn't know where water was um it was not easy to map read because of the trees and the terrain. And um, two RAR soldiers with me uh, crept up to me uh, at night and said, uh, give us the water bottles, we will go and find water and bring it back here. And I said, you're crazy. I said, you won't be able to walk a um, 100 meters from here and you'll get permanently lost. They said, we will find the water and we will come up, we will come back here. And anyway, we gave them all of our water bottles, which they put in two empty packs, and they slithered off into the night, the two of them, and they were gone for hours. Um, I was drinking the juice from a tin of oranges at that point. My mouth was swollen from thirst. And around about three or four in the morning, they, we heard them slithering back into camp. They gave the password, they came back in. We were given our, our water bottles, and I drank the sweetest tasting elephant piss in my life. It was just beautiful. And anyway, I, I first was slated. Uh, the next morning after breakfast, they said, we'll take you back to a bigger pond where we can get fresher water. And I'm not joking that we we must have walked uh, three kilometers or more through that broken undulating ground that you would get like a maze, like a maze, and you would get lost in it in daytime. 
And these guys not only found the water, but they got all the way back to us. Um, we had an unfortunate incident there um, where a fellow called Hickey, very, very sadly, uh, got killed. Um, the elephants in the area had created tunnels in the undergrowth in, uh, along the riverbanks, like where all the vines had sort of grown over the top of where the elephants would walk and he was walking down one of these tunnels and um, an elephant that had been uh, badly injured in the minefield that had been set up between Rhodesia and Mozambique had had the front portion of its um, trunk blown off in the plowshares that are suspended at round about chest level on a human being and that took his trunk off and so this uh, enraged animal uh, very sadly pinned Rob to the ground and killed him and that, that was a terrible loss and so once again these darn people eluded every attempt to find them even though they were everywhere um, and I was really angry that I went home on yet another call up without having a contact and we exited through Crook's Corner. About 40 of us came out, two platoons, and um, they had opened a pathway through the minefield there where there were anti-personnel mines and these plowshares that had been fitted at chest height. Uh, a little sandbag pathway had been made through there with a guard at the Rhodesian site. As we came out of Mozambique, all looking dirty and filthy and covered in camouflage. Standing there, not 30 meters into the Rhodesian side, was a beautiful blonde girl uh, in uniform with her cap on. And we all just filed past with our mouths hanging on the ground. We couldn't believe that a girl would be out there, but such a pretty girl as well. And I believe she was part of the engineer groups, a group uh, that, that were laying the mines and all that sort of stuff. I don't quite know what her role or capacity was, but it was so nice to see that girl. And really, that was the end of my national service down in the southeast. I was so angered uh, by the frustration that I'd been through in both my national service and my territorial service of not being able to engage the enemy when I just heard everyone else was having a field day that um, I asked for a transfer to support company uh, 2RR and um, this is where I experienced the most joy of being a soldier when I was put in charge of a platoon of mortars and anti-tank weapons and I'll be talking about the one exceptional episode that I experienced in talk number seven so thank you for uh, sticking with me in this talk and um, I look forward to seeing you in talk number seven. Thank you. Bye.